In this video, we're going to look at 18 more things our brain can't handle. First up, we've got some stunning optical illusions to look at. We often go through life thinking that the world is exactly how we see it. That's because we instinctively trust our eyes. But maybe that's our first mistake, because it's not our eyes doing the processing of visual information. It's our brain. We're not seeing the world as it is. We're seeing the world as our brain perceives it, and it occasionally gets things wrong. Optical illusions are the perfect way to demonstrate this. We're going to look at 15 of the world's best ones to try to understand better what's going on. But that's not all you're getting in this action-packed video. Also coming up, we're going to look at a psychological phenomenon which sees people liking someone more after they've done a favour for them. It's called the Ben Franklin effect, and thanks to a cognitive bias, it's something that you can initiate that can cause someone to like you more. If you think that's too good to be true, be sure to stick around until later in the video. And finally, I'm going to share with you my recent short video on pareidolia. Just what's going on when we see faces in everyday objects? It happens to you and it happens to me and we need to try to understand what's going on. That's all coming up. I couldn't fit everything into my last video on the brain. So here's 18 more things our brain can't handle. Welcome to 15 of the best optical illusions. Let's start off with an easy one. We should have no problem with the Sander illusion, named after German psychologist Friedrich Sander, who published it in 1926. Which diagonal line is the longest? This one or this one? I'll give you 10 seconds to work it out. believe me, but the lines are in fact identical in length. Our brain is getting confused about these lines within the distorted parallelogram. To prove this, you can pause the video and measure it on screen, but I'll also disassemble it for comparison. You do need to trust me here, I have not changed the length of these lines. Your brain has. I'll leave it on screen for another 10 seconds to see if you can make any sense of it. This is the Fraser Spiral Illusion. It's named after British psychologist Sir James Fraser, who published it in 1908. Your brain is telling you that you're looking at a spiral, but it's getting confused because of the pattern around it and misaligned parts. You are in fact looking at complete and independent concentric circles. Your brain is making up that spiral. Try following the circles around if you don't believe me. I'll give you 10 seconds to try to make sense of it. Penrose stairs, made popular by Lionel and Roger Penrose. Going clockwise, you're always going downhill in one continuous loop. This structure is impossible to recreate in three dimensions, but it well and truly fools our brain, which cannot make any sense of it. I'll give you another 10 seconds to imagine yourself walking down these never-ending steps. illusion was discovered by German physiologist Ewald Herring in 1861. Are those red lines parallel or are they bowed? I'll give you five seconds to work it out. They are, of course, perfectly parallel, but we see them as bowed. When lines are presented in front of a radial background, our brain can't fully understand what's going on. The 
shallow face illusion perfectly demonstrates that we have an incredible inbuilt bias for seeing faces as convex. Over millions of years of human evolution, we've recognized faces as convex because they are, of course, convex. But if a face is presented as concave, something kicks in. We immediately convert it to convex. Such is the strength of this deep-seated cognitive bias. These computer-generated hollow faces play havoc with our brain. I'll leave this running for another 10 seconds. They're such fun to watch. The Jastroff illusion is named after Polish-American psychologist Joseph Jastroff. Any parent watching that struggled to despair with wooden train tracks knows exactly what I'm about to say. Which piece of track is the longest? I'll give you five seconds to work it out. They are, of course, exactly the same size, but that's not what our brain is telling us. There is no universally accepted explanation here as to why our brain is getting this wrong. The most common theory is that the brain gets confused because of the comparisons with an inner and outer radius. I'll digitally overlay the pieces of track to prove that they are, in fact, the same size. Now everything makes sense, until I put it back into its original place, and it all goes wrong again. Oscar Reutersvard created this 3D drawing in the 1930s, which does appear feasible. Initially, our brain seems to be only too happy to accept this image of triangles made up of cubes. Nothing to see here, so let's move on. But on closer inspection, we find that it plays havoc with our intuitive knowledge of physics. It cannot be physically recreated in the real world. I'll leave this on screen for a further 15 seconds to see if you can get your head around it. This is the stepping feet illusion. It's a motion perception phenomenon. These two objects are moving at an identical and constant speed, but their speed appears to vary dramatically. When the blue object is over a white stripe, the contrast is high, so we perceive its speed to be faster. Against black, it appears to go slower. The same process is repeated for the yellow image, but in reverse. I'll leave the incredible stepping feet illusion playing for another 10 seconds. <laughs> This is called white's illusion. It's a brightness illusion. We've got two gray bars interspersed with black and white stripes. Which gray bar is the brightest? I'll give you five seconds to work it out. Both gray bars have in fact the same color, luminance and opacity. The black and white stripes have interfered with our color perception. The Zollner illusion was discovered by German astrophysicist Johann Zollner in 1860. Are the long lines parallel? I'll give you 10 seconds to work it out. The long lines are perfectly parallel. The repeated short lines are either horizontal or vertical. These short lines give the impression that the long lines are not parallel. Your perception of even the short lines may also be distorted. Let me take away the short lines. Now your brain can make sense of it. Anyone that's watched an old spaghetti western will be familiar with the wagon wheel effect, where a spoked wheel appears to rotate in the opposite direction of its true rotation. The effect is caused because of the sample rate that our brain is using for processing. It's known as a form of temporal aliasing.
This is the Poggendorf illusion. It's a geometrical optical illusion. Straight black and red lines are obscured by the grey shape. Does the black line connect with the blue line or the red line if we were to reveal the connection? I'll give you 10 seconds to work it out. black line is connected to the red line. Your brain is making assumptions on where those lines are going and getting it wrong. Your brain is perceiving an apparent position shift of the lower portion of the line. Hybrid images were developed in the 90s at MIT and Glasgow University. You can perceive them in one of two ways, depending upon how far you are away from the image. They are made from different spatial frequencies, causing your brain to interpret them differently. I'm going to shrink down each image to simulate the picture being far away, and I'll gradually increase the size, simulating the image getting closer. Viewing these images at full size will also work, but you would need to vary the distance you are away from your screen. changing these images as they get closer to you, your brain is perceiving them differently based upon distance. What first comes to mind when you see this boat? If it's a face that you can see, then you're experiencing pareidolia. It's due to a highly tuned area of your brain called the fusiform face area. We're going to be looking into this phenomenon in more detail towards the end of the video, right after the astonishing Ben Franklin effect. Do people really like you more after they have done you a favour? That's coming up. There's a psychological phenomenon that sees people liking someone more after they've done a favour for them. It's linked to a cognitive bias and it's been known about for over 200 years. As fantastical as the notion might sound that you can initiate something that makes somebody else like you more, it is backed up with a scientific explanation. And it's been proved to be true in countless studies around the world. So if it's that big of a deal, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about the Ben Franklin effect. Benjamin Franklin was one of the greatest intellectuals of the 18th century, possibly even of all time. What a man! He was one of the founding fathers of the United States. He was a signatory to the Declaration of Independence. He wrote some of the Declaration of Independence. He was a writer, a scientist and a newspaper editor. Quite how he found the time to be a prominent politician as well is beyond me but he was. In the 1760s, he served in the Pennsylvania Assembly, rising to speaker in 1764. Politics then, as now, was a messy business. Collecting enemies was easy, but there was one particular man, a rival legislator to Franklin in the Pennsylvania Assembly, who displayed particular animosity towards him. Franklin never named the man. He talked about how he dealt with the situation in his autobiography, along with what he described as an old maxim, which was, he that has once done you kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom yourself have obliged. In other words, getting someone to do you a favour is more likely to make them like you than if you did a favour for them. That does sound counterintuitive. Let me just repeat that. Getting someone else to do you a favour that you're not even going to repay is more likely to make them like you than if you did a favour for them. Franklin went on to say that he had heard that his rival legislator had in his library a very scarce and curious book. I wrote a note to him expressing my desire of perusing that book and requesting he do me the favour of lending it to me for a few days. He sent it immediately and I returned it in about a week with another note expressing strongly my sense of the favour. When we next met in the house, he spoke to me, which he had never done before, and with great civility. And he ever after manifested a readiness to serve me on all occasions, so that we became great friends, and our friendship continued to his death. 
So Franklin dealt with the situation by asking his rival for a favour. He asked for a favour and he did not even repay the favour. He let it hang there as an unrepaid and outstanding act of kindness on the part of this man that Franklin himself had initiated. Surely if we want to be liked, we need to shower them with favours. That's how you get liked. Well, it turns out that no, it's not. Before we try to make sense of it, let's have a look at something from the field of psychology called cognitive dissonance. It's the mental toll and anguish that we can feel when faced with the perception of contradictory information. Cognitive dissonance is psychological stress caused by two things that are inconsistent with each other. We then go out of our way to reduce the cognitive dissonance so that they become consistent. We do that in four main ways. Let's say I'm a big supporter of a particular celebrity. I like his shows and everybody knows it. But it's just been on the news that he's done something awful. Continuing to like the celebrity whilst also acknowledging the awful thing he's done creates cognitive dissonance. Mental stress, because the two things are inconsistent with each other. Now I've got four main options to resolve the cognitive dissonance. I can change my behavior. I can decide that I'm no longer supportive of the celebrity. Cognitive dissonance resolved. I can justify his behavior to redress the balance. I can decide that his behavior wasn't really that bad and it's all been hyped up by the press anyway. And after all, we are all human. Cognitive dissonance resolved. I can justify my behavior. Hey, it's the shows I like. This bad thing is nothing to do with that. I can separate those two things out. Cognitive dissonance resolved. I can ignore or deny the new information. There's no way he did that bad thing. Did it even happen? It's a conspiracy. Cognitive dissonance resolved. So what has cognitive dissonance got to do with the Ben Franklin effect? Well, the cognitive dissonance is between the subject's negative attitudes to the other person and the knowledge that they did them a favor. If I've just done a favor for someone, I need to know that I like them. We reason that if we help others, we do so because we like them. We do this even if we don't like them. We must resolve the logical inconsistency. We must balance out the cognitive dissonance. In 1969, a study of this effect was carried out. Students were invited to take part in a competition by a researcher, and they were told that they could win money. A third of the students who had won were spoken to by the researcher, who asked them to return the money. He explained that he'd used his own funds to pay the winners, and he was running low on cash. Another third were asked by the secretary to return the money. She said the psychology department was was running low on funds. The last third weren't asked to return the cash. All three groups were then asked how much they liked the researcher. Overwhelmingly, the group who had been asked by the researcher himself to return the money liked him the most. But if we ask someone for a favor, aren't we showing weakness or even vulnerability? Well, not according to countless self-help books, which say that asking for a favor can be perceived by the person as complimentary, as it shows you admire and respect them. So maybe there's two forces at play when we ask someone for a favor. It's causing someone to resolve a cognitive dissonance about us, whilst at the same time raising their view of us because we've shown them admiration and respect. Again, counterintuitively, it's our own actions towards someone that shapes our perceptions of them. You tend to like people to whom you are kind. Psychologists tested this out at the University of North Carolina in 1971. Subjects were asked to teach students to memorize sequences tapped out by a drumstick. Each subject was given two students to teach. For one, they were asked to provide support and encouragement when they got a sequence correct. For the other, they were asked to scorn and ridicule them if they got a sequence wrong. Afterwards, all of the subjects were asked which of the students they liked the most. Overwhelmingly and across the board, the subjects said they liked the students to whom they had been supportive and encouraging. They were deciding who they liked based upon their own behavior. Nothing to do with the people they profess to like or dislike. The Ben Franklin effect has been observed in countless areas, such as politics, sales, and even personal relationships. Logic might tell us that doing favors for others 
will cause them to like us. But let us remind ourselves of the words of Ben Franklin. He that has once done you kindness will be more ready to do you another than he whom yourself have obliged. Even if they don't have warm feelings towards you, they'll redress their cognitive dissonance by liking you more. After all, you don't do favours for people you don't like. Added to that, their perception of you might improve because they perceive that you have shown them admiration and respect. So there you have it. Want someone to like you more? Ask them for a favour. Next up, pareidolia. Just why do we see faces and things? In this video, I'm going to show you 48 of the very best examples of pareidolia. Pareidolia is the tendency in humans to see meanings and purpose in something when there's none there. We impose a meaningful interpretation onto something. It's a type of apophnia. That's where we see meaningful connections between unrelated things. Another example of apophnia is the gambler's fallacy. Choosing heads on a coin toss just because five tails in a row have been called. It makes no sense but we do it anyway. The most stark realisation of pareidolia is seeing faces and things. But sometimes we see objects and animals as well, in the unlikeliest of places, and it happens fast. We can see a face and we can even gauge the mood of the face that our brain has just made up. You don't need to do any work here. You don't need to go through a thought process to imagine a face. You experience a very early and speedy automatic process. Cognitive processes swing into action with the slightest of face-like objects. These processes alert you to the identity and the mood of the face, even before your conscious mind computes it. It could be in a brick wall, a puddle, a cloud formation, or just unusual lighting. Studies have been done on pareidolia, trying to understand how we can see faces in random images and scenes, easily and with zero effort. It's now thought that we've evolved to process faces and the emotions behind them at lightning speed. Imagine living hundreds of thousands of years ago and coming across a threatening person, but had to spend minutes mulling over whether they're friendly or not. Well, that could be the end of you, and you wouldn't get a chance to pass on your genes. People who are faster at gauging the mood of others had an advantage and they were more likely to survive. They could flee and take themselves out of harm's way and then go on to reproduce. Researchers have theorised that it's natural selection at play. Maybe that's why we've all become world-class experts in faces and mood recognition. There's a part of our brain dedicated to it and it's highly tuned. It's called the fusiform face area. It activates at astonishing speed if you see a face. It also activates at almost the same speed if we see something that's perceived as a face. In pareidolia, it seems that this area of our brain just gets a little bit overexcitable. It can mistakenly interpret something with face-like qualities as an actual face. If you subject a person with images of faces and then give them an MRI scan, this area of the brain lights up. It's the part of the human visualization system that specializes in facial recognition. Pareidolia is facial recognition in faceless objects. Your brain has given you fast track information on mood and threat levels. Let's prime our fusiform face area for some action as we look for 48 faces and things. Please allow me just 15 seconds to plug this channel. Very Nearly Interesting is a brand new channel and I need all the help I can get. Please hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. That's how YouTube knows you like it and they'll show it to more people. And please consider subscribing. That way we might see you again. Well, let's start off gently. My threat levels are pretty low with this little fella. Well, that's just about the cutest fire hydrant I've ever seen. Hmm, not sure about this fence post. I'm gonna give him a wide berth. What a friendly house. Well, you just couldn't eat that little fella in the middle, could you? This is the rocks of Dwerger in Goza, Malta. It looks like he's in party mood to me. These are 50 foot high rocks in Staffordshire, England.
this cup of coffee has messed up and he knows it. I really feel like I shouldn't see a face on this one, but here we are. I think he just wants to be loved. He looks like he's out of breath, or maybe it's a hot day. Finally, a cute pussycat. This house does seem rather shifty to me. I'll have to keep my eye on him. This poor fella looks terrified. Breathe, come on, we can get through this. It's the dangly zip that makes all the difference on this one. Now that's an Austin Healy with character. Is it just me or is this the first female we've seen? Most people categorize faces and things as male. We're not sure why. Well, you just couldn't throw this rubbish out now, could you? I feel like he's smiling through adversity. Life's delivered some blows for him. He's had a shock, hasn't he? Breathe, come on, everything's gonna be fine. Looks like Dirty Harry. I know what you're thinking, punk. Do I like this video or like and subscribe? Go on, make my day. Oh, this little fella just needs some TLC. This rock should not work, but it does. He just wants a good home. I feel this wall's pain, I really do. This is exactly how I look first thing in the morning. Oh, he's even got a little goatee look. This little tree stump isn't letting setbacks get him down. This little sponge cake is just happy to be part of your day. I don't trust his face. He looks rather vacant, doesn't he? This is a meteorite crater in Russia. Imagine all the destruction and devastation, but he's smiling through it. A Dutch electrical socket, always happy to power your appliances. Now you couldn't eat him, could you? He looks like he's been through a lot. I feel like this barn door is surprised to see me. Well, that's a sad rock. Nothing's gone right for him. Just nothing. Well, that street sign is just terrified. I wonder if this clock just looks like this in the mornings. I 
I'm going to say that his bark is worse than his bite. He's not all bad. You've just got to get to know him. That's sinister. I don't like the crowd we're mixing in now. Oh, he's just waiting for me, ready to pounce. I'm off. It's like he's been chopped down and the entire experience is etched on his face. Ah, a terrifying ghoul. I wasn't ready for that. I wouldn't trust this rock face as far as I could throw him. He's too sneaky. Oh, this, oh, this video's taken a scary turn now. Another sad alarm clock. Ah, it's a Mercedes-Benz wheel. You are not my father. fair, if I was a toilet, I'd probably look like this as well. This one's beyond bee leaf. He seems such a wrong one, doesn't he? Well, this one's upset me. Have you ever seen such a sad sight? After I'd finished editing the faces section, I saw faces in absolutely everything. Please let me know if that happened to you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please click that like button. That way YouTube will show it to more people. And please consider subscribing. That way I might see you again. And please have a look at some of the other content on the channel. There's lots of interesting things on there. Well, very nearly interesting.